Hey everyone, ready to get our minds blown? Today, we're diving deep into time and reality. You've really pulled together some fascinating stuff for this one. Articles, transcripts, even some wild visual theories. Right, and from such a diverse range of sources. Like we have stuff from physicists like Julian Barber and Bernard Carr. A spiritual leader, Sadhguru. Even insights from ancient traditions like the Vedic and Hopi cultures. It's a total mashup, but all trying to answer the same huge questions like, what if time isn't actually linear? Or flowing forward like we experience it? What if our perception of time is just our brains messing with us? And here's another one. Mm. What if size is completely relative and the universe isn't expanding into anything at all? It's a lot to wrap your head around. But for everyone listening, it's a chance to get a new perspective on these big ideas you know, without having to wade through tons of dense academic papers. Okay, let's jump in. We might as well start with physicist Julian Barber. He has some pretty radical ideas about time. Yeah, he just throws out this whole concept of time as a flowing river. He says time is just about changes in the shapes of things. Okay, so no flowing river, just changes in shapes. How does that even work? Barber sees the universe as a massive collection of snapshots. Each one is a unique arrangement of all the matter in the universe. I'm picturing it like frames in a cosmic film, but they all exist at once. Exactly. And our sense of time passing comes from observing the changes between these snapshots. Kind of like when you watch those film frames in rapid succession, it creates the illusion of motion. So if each frame is a different configuration of the universe, wouldn't there have to be a frame where everything's at its simplest? Barber calls this the Janus point, a snapshot of the universe at its smallest size and maximum uniformity. You could picture it like a perfectly smooth, featureless ball of matter. So is that the Big Bang? The okay. beginning of everything? Well, that's where it gets really interesting. Barbara says that Janus Point isn't a beginning, but a midpoint. Time flows in two directions from this point. So there are two separate timelines diverging from the Janus Point. Whoa, hold on. Two timelines. Two eras of time. Does that mean time is flowing backward on one side? Not exactly. It's more about how the universe evolves away from that initial uniformity at the Janus Point. Hmm. Think of it like this. One timeline evolves towards increasing entropy, that classic idea of things becoming more disordered. Right, like everything eventually falls apart. Yeah, but the other timeline evolves towards increasing complexity. So both timelines have an arrow of time, but they're defined differently. One by entropy, the other by complexity. Did I get that right? You got it. And both timelines would experience an arrow of time, a directionality, even though time itself isn't actually flowing. Okay, my brain's starting to hurt a little. But thinking about this Janus point as a midpoint, not the beginning, what does that mean for our understanding of the Big Bang? Does it even make sense to talk about a beginning anymore? It really challenges our assumptions, doesn't it? Maybe the Big Bang isn't a singular event that kicked everything off, but more like a transition point in this grand ongoing process of change. So instead of a linear timeline with a definite start, we're looking at something much more cyclical. But what about the arrow of time? How does cause and effect work if time isn't flowing forward in a straight line? That's one of the big questions Barber's theory raises. Uh. But he suggests that even without a flowing time, there can still be a directionality to change. It's about the relationships between those snapshots, how they influence and lead to each other, even if they're not happening in a sequence. So much to think about. And it makes me wonder, if time isn't linear, what does that mean for free will? If the past and future exist in some way, are our choices already made for us? That's definitely getting into some deep philosophical territory. But Barber's theory of time as snapshots actually leads him to another fascinating concept, shape dynamics. Shape dynamics. Okay, you've got my attention. Tell me more. Well, shape dynamics challenges another fundamental assumption. We have the idea of absolute size and distance. You know, how we assume a meter is always a meter. Yeah, a meter's a meter. That's how we measure things. What's Barber saying about this? He's suggesting that what truly matters are the relationships between objects, the ratios and proportions that define their shapes. And here's where it gets really wild. He proposes that the universe might not be expanding into something bigger at all. Instead, maybe expansion is just a consequence of how we perceive changes in these fundamental relationships. Wait, so instead of the universe being like an ever-expanding balloon, it's more like things are rearranging themselves. And that's what we see as expansion. I need a visual here. Can you give me an example? Yeah, think about a simple triangle. Its triangularity comes from the relationship between its three points, not its absolute size. A tiny triangle and a gigantic triangle, the shape's the same. 
So it's like the information contained within the shit matters more than its physical size. Exactly. And if you apply this concept of scale invariance, that's what it's called, to the whole universe, then the universe isn't expanding into something bigger. Instead, its internal relationships are just changing, which leads to what we see as expansion. Okay, my brain is officially doing backflips. Yeah. But if shape dynamics is so fundamental, how does it fit with everything else we know about the universe? Like, what about Einstein's theory of general relativity and all that stuff about curved space-time? That's where Barber's work gets really controversial. He actually suggests that shape dynamics could be an alternative way to understand gravity, one that doesn't even rely on the curvature of space-time. Are you saying Einstein might have been wrong about gravity? Not necessarily wrong, but maybe incomplete. Barber thinks shape dynamics could offer a more fundamental explanation one that might even help us understand some of the mysteries of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics. Okay, now we're talking. That's where things get really weird. How could shape dynamics possibly explain something like the double slit experiment? It's mind-bending stuff, but stick with me. Remember how in the double slit experiment, light acts like both a particle and a wave? Yeah, it's like it can go through both slits at the same time, and then you get that interference pattern. But if you try to measure which slit it goes through, the pattern disappears. It's like it knows you're watching. Exactly. The traditional interpretation is that observation somehow forces the light to choose one path or the other. But Barber suggests that maybe the interference patterns aren't about the particles themselves being strange, but about correlations in the fabric of space-time. So the experiment, the slits, the detectors, all of that is actually influencing the structure of space-time itself, and that's what determines the outcome. It's a pretty radical idea, but it fits with his whole framework. Mm. If the universe is fundamentally about shapes and relationships, then even observation becomes part of that structure. Like the experiment is shaping the reality it's measuring. Wow, so we're not just passive observers. We're actively shaping the universe. That's a pretty profound idea. And it kind of reminds me of something else Barber challenges. The traditional view of entropy. The whole idea that the universe is constantly moving towards disorder. You're right. While most physicists see entropy as this driving force, Barber suggests it might actually be a secondary phenomenon, something that emerges within localized systems, but not necessarily the whole universe. So instead of the universe running down like a clock, it's actually becoming more complex and organized over time. Doesn't that go against everything we know about thermodynamics? It's definitely a bold claim. <laughs> but he uses some interesting evidence from Newtonian physics to back it up, something called the three-body problem. It involves three particles interacting under gravity's influence. Okay, I'm following so far. How does this three-body problem challenge the idea of entropy? Imagine you have these three particles arranged in a perfectly balanced symmetrical state. Then, when you let the system evolve using Newtonian equations, something fascinating happens. The particles don't just drift into randomness. Instead, they start interacting in increasingly complex ways, forming intricate patterns. So the system moves away from this initial uniformity towards greater complexity. Precisely. And for Barber, this suggests that the whole universe might be characterized by the growth of structure and complexity, even while localized systems exhibit entropy. So maybe the universe isn't heading for a heat death, but evolving into something even more intricate and fascinating. That's a pretty optimistic view. It is. But before we get carried away with all the implications of that, we still have a lot more to explore. There's the whole concept of the multiverse, ancient wisdom about the cyclical nature of time, and even how our own brains create our experience of time. So much more to uncover. And so little time. But that's a perfect place to pause for now. You know, it's pretty amazing to think that all of these really complex ideas, from the structure of the universe to the way our minds work, they're all kind of connected. Yeah, totally. Okay, but ready for another mind bender? Let's talk about the multiverse. Multiple universes. That always sounds like something straight out of science fiction. Right. But is there actually any evidence to support it? Or is it just a cool theoretical idea? Well, the multiverse actually pops up in a few different areas of physics. Cosmology, string theory. Mm. It's definitely a hot topic. So some serious science is backing it up then. Yeah, but there's a lot of debate too. Some physicists argue that the multiverse is completely untestable. Meaning we might never know for sure if it's real. Right. While other physicists think the multiverse is the best way to explain certain things we observe about the cosmos. So it's a giant cosmic mystery. We could be part of a much grander reality than we ever imagined. It really makes you feel small, doesn't it? Totally. It also leads to some pretty big philosophical questions. You're right. 
One of the sources you gave me a conversation between cosmologist Bernard Carr and spiritual leader Sadhguru. They actually touch on the idea that the multiverse could explain consciousness. Wait, consciousness? How are those two things connected? So Carr basically says that if there are all these different universes out there, maybe consciousness is fundamental. Like built into the fabric of reality itself. Exactly. Existing in different forms across those different universes. We're just experiencing one particular expression of it. Whoa. So there could be tons of versions of ourselves out there experiencing reality in totally different ways. It's pretty wild, right? And speaking of different ways of experiencing reality, Sadhguru brings up the idea that human time might be totally different from cosmic time. Okay, I'm intrigued. What's he getting at? Well, he draws on these Eastern spiritual traditions, suggesting that our human experience of time, past, present, future, is just a tiny blip compared to the vastness of the multiverse. So, like, our perception of time is zoomed in on this one little section of something much bigger. Right. And on that cosmic scale, maybe time works in ways we can't even wrap our heads around. I'm starting to feel like our human understanding of time is pretty limited. It probably is. But speaking of time, let's look at how some ancient cultures viewed it. Like, the Vedic tradition has this concept of yugas, vast cycles of time that govern the rise and fall of civilizations. Yugas. I've heard of those, but I'm not really clear on what they are. Basically, think of these huge cycles of time, thousands of years long, that influence everything. Everything. From the development of societies to the level of spiritual awareness in the world. The Vedic tradition says there are four yugas, Satya, Treta, Dvapara, and Kali Yuga. Four yugas, and each one has its own unique vibe. Yeah. Each yuga has specific characteristics and a balance of, like, virtue and negativity. So it's like this cosmic clock cycling through light and dark periods. Where do we fit into all of this? That's up for debate. Traditional Hindu thought puts us at the start of Kali Yuga, the age of darkness and ignorance. Oh no, the dark ages. But there's another interpretation by a 19th century yogi named Sri Yukteswar. He thought we were actually transitioning from Kali Yuga to Dvara Yuga, an age of increasing knowledge and energy. Okay, so even within the same tradition, there are different interpretations of where we stand. But does it really matter which yuga we're in? Like, does it actually affect us? It really depends on how you look at it. Some people find it comforting to know that these cycles exist. Even during tough times, there's this promise of renewal. Right, like a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, exactly. And for other people, it's more of a framework, like a way to make sense of the challenges and opportunities we're facing right now. I like that. If we're moving into an age of more knowledge and energy, maybe that could help us make a positive difference in the world. Totally. And it's pretty cool how these ancient ideas kind of resonate with what we're seeing today. The fast pace of technology, global shifts in consciousness, even prophecies like the one from the Hopi tradition about time speeding up. It all seems to align with the idea of transitioning between yugas. It really makes you think that these ancient cultures had a deeper understanding of time than we give them credit for. Right. They didn't see time as this straight line, but as something cyclical. Maybe they were onto something. Which brings us to another super important aspect of this whole discussion. How our brains construct our experience of time. Yeah, what if our perception of time isn't just influenced by these big cosmic cycles, but also by the way our minds work? So we're getting into neuroscience now. Yeah. Cool. How does the brain factor into all of this? Well, our experience of time is totally subjective, right? It speeds up, slows down. Sometimes it even seems to disappear completely. Like when you're having fun or when something scary happens, time can feel like it's in slow motion. Exactly. Yeah. One of the sources you shared tells this crazy story of Michelle Siffrey, a geologist who spent six months living in a cave totally isolated. Uh, I remember reading about him. Didn't he lose track of time? He totally did. His days stretched out to 32 hours because he had no external cues like clocks or sunlight to guide his internal clock. Living in a cave for six months. That's dedication to science. But what about our everyday experience of time? How does our brain create that? There's some awesome research by a neuroscientist named Dean Buonamano. He suggests that our brains have multiple ways to track time. Some are for really short intervals, others are for longer durations. So our brain is juggling multiple timekeeping systems all at once. It is. And what's fascinating is that these systems are all tied up with our memory and perception, which is how we get this feeling of time flowing smoothly and continuously. It's like our brain is constantly creating this movie of our lives, the past, the present, the future, 
all seamlessly woven together. It's pretty much doing that behind the scenes without us even realizing it. Yeah, we take our experience of time for granted, but it's so much more complex and subjective than we think. Absolutely. And to illustrate that, you included the story of Clive Waring, a musician who had some really severe brain damage. He can't form new memories, so he basically lives in a perpetual present moment. Oh, wow. So every few seconds, it's like he's waking up for the first time. That's exactly it. He can't hold on to past experiences, so he has no sense of time passing. What a heartbreaking condition. But it shows just how important memory is for our experience of time. Right. Without the ability to remember, there's no feeling of continuity. So it's not like we're really experiencing this objective now. It's more like our brain is constantly constructing our now from our immediate memories and perceptions. They're getting it. It really challenges our basic assumptions about what's real. Right. If time is the subjective thing shaped by our brains, then what does that mean for how we perceive the world around us? It's kind of like saying that the reality we experience is, at least in part, a construct of our own minds. We're not just passive observers. We're actively involved in shaping the world as we perceive it. Wow. That's both mind-blowing and a little bit scary. I know, right? But it's also a reminder that we're constantly learning and evolving our understanding of the universe. And the more we learn about time, the more we realize how much we don't know. That's for sure. My mind feels pretty stretched after all of this. We've covered a lot of ground, from the Janus point to the multiverse, from ancient wisdom to the latest in neuroscience. We have. And in our last segment, we'll explore what all of this means for how we see ourselves, our place in the universe, and even our destiny. Wow. I have to say, exploring all these different ideas about time and reality has really shifted my perspective. It's like seeing the world with new eyes. Yeah, it's amazing how these abstract concepts can really make you rethink how you see yourself and the universe around you. From the Janus point in shape dynamics to the multiverse and the yugas, we've been on quite the journey. It's been a lot to take in, but I think that's what I love about deep dives like this. It makes you question everything and it opens up all these possibilities. You're absolutely right. But as we wrap up, I think it's important to ask, what does all this mean for our listeners? Why should they care about these ideas? They might seem kind of far out there, you know, not really relevant to everyday life. That's a good point. It's easy to get caught up in the intellectual side of things, but what's the takeaway for people? How can they apply this to their lives? Hmm. I think one of the most important takeaways is just remembering to stay open to different perspectives, even those that challenge our beliefs. Like, even if an idea seems crazy at first, there might be something valuable to learn from it. Right. It's all about cultivating that sense of curiosity and wonder allowing yourself to be amazed by the mysteries of the universe. I love that. It reminds me of that saying, the more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know. Exactly. And that's not a bad thing. It keeps us exploring, asking questions, and learning. And maybe as we learn about the universe, we learn more about ourselves too. That's a great point. You know, there's this one big question that's been bugging me throughout this whole deep dive. We've talked about how time might not be linear, how the observer plays a role, all this stuff. So what does it all mean for free will and destiny? Do we actually have any control over our lives? Ah, free will versus destiny. That's the question, isn't it? Philosophers and scientists have been wrestling with that one for centuries. Yeah, no easy answers there. But do you think the stuff we've explored today gives us a new way to think about it? Possibly. I mean, if time isn't this straightforward thing and the past and future might exist in some way alongside the present, then our choices might have a bigger impact than we realize. So you're saying our actions could be influencing not just our own lives, but maybe even the universe as a whole. It's definitely a possibility. And as we become more aware of that interconnectedness, maybe we can make more conscious choices, choices that are in line with our values. I like that. It's empowering and a bit humbling at the same time. It is. It's like saying we have this power to shape our own destinies, but we're also part of something much bigger. A cosmic dance. Right. And as we wrap up our deep dive, I think that's a pretty beautiful thought to leave everyone with. The universe is so strange mm. and mysterious and incredible. And by embracing curiosity, questioning our assumptions, and staying open to all the possibilities, we can keep exploring its wonders and finding our place within it. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> so to everyone listening, thank you so much for joining us on this mind-bending adventure. We encourage you to keep exploring the ideas we've talked about today, whether it's checking out Julian Barber's work, learning more about the yugas, or diving into the mysteries of the multiverse, keep asking questions and never stop exploring. And until next time.